That's the idea. It's wonderful. It's great to uh, to have you say that even now. Uh, this bill for founders. Uh, Jeremy, I'm sure you've got several large customers, right? Who are also, you know, providing a pretty substantial portion of at least the volume that goes through you and perhaps uh, disproportionate amounts of revenue. Uh, and as the company has evolved, uh, I'm sure a lot of that success came on perhaps faster than you imagined, probably at a much larger scale than you had imagined, uh, because I know what you pitched me in 2015, right? So it was definitely not what they've ended up being. It's a, this is much, much bigger, right? So as companies go through that, right, how do you sense those inflection points Right, and and obviously sometimes you need to get aggressive and you know jump on those. Right, so what are some tips here for the young founders to say you know when are, when things are going well, you know when you bounce? Yeah, so I think the answer might be different for different players, but for us we were very clear that our stakeholder is a is a business owner. That that has changed. That that hasn't changed throughout our journey. What has changed is what codes we offer to that business owner. So so we started with payment gateway because, as I said, that's what we started as a. Learn the, the first column. If you want to start an interim business, the first thing you need is payments. That's how we stumbled into it. Now, as we kept as we kept solving the problem for payments, we kept speaking to these customer base and understand, hey, what are the problems that you face with managing finances? What are the challenges you face? And we just learned that a lot of businesses, while they accept money, they also have a problem of dispersing money out, whether it's paying salaries, whether it's paying vendors. So we started building on that set of things. Then access to credit became the third big problem, and then we started building raise up a capital and so on and so forth. So we kept evolving the broad direction, the broad vision kept getting broadened. And the way it broadened is by, by just constantly talking to your customers. So I, even today, I speak to at least one customer a week and that helps me constantly get this get this sense of what are they looking for, what is their core, core problem. And no matter how much strategies and plans you build inside the company or when you are the largest of consultants like McKinsey and stuff, the real answer always lies with the customer. So speak that that conversation that I do once a week with, with the customer, asking them what is their next problem, what is the next challenge that they are facing. I think that really shifts up the 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 roadmap for us. That doesn't mean build everything that your customer wants wants, but the idea is to constantly learn what are the top problems that they face, and the more conversations you do, the more you can figure out the common thread out of it, and then distill what could be the next thing that you can build. So that is how the journey has evolved for us over the last. Nine years. Amazing. Um, look, a lot of things we don't see, right, as external customers, right? And one of the things that is critical in the payments business in particular is the customers can take a downtime, but you cannot because there's always some customer who's live. And a system that is so critical has to be sort of fail safe, right? So, right from the early days, you know, RazorPay has always had this amazing reputation of this, it just works, right? Um, how did you guys think along, you know, from right from the beginning to make sure that availability, you know, success ratios, all of that are uh, yeah. always, you know, top of the stack? As we are both techie and product founders, right, that was the core of our DNA. The biggest problem in the fintech and payment spaces is not just our infrastructure that we depend on. There's a, we, while with all the shiny stuff that we build on top, at the back, we are relying on a lot of old, dated infrastructure, sometimes with banks, sometimes with networks, and a lot of failures happen there. So so what we have to do is build a constantly a lot of redundancies to counter that, right? Like so from day one, Facebook had the uh, uh, had the reputation of having one of the highest success rate and the way we were able to do that is by constantly having like three or four redundancies for everything where we hit outside our systems. So when we hit bank systems to do a transition, we had like three or four gateways and our systems will constantly dynamically roll out transitions so that the so that no matter what is the time of the day, if a bank is going a midnight, maintenance that like it, and it was fairly easy for banks to say, hey, we are shut for one hour because we are doing maintenance. And it was hard for us to say that to our customers. So constantly we had to build redundancies in the backend platforms. And it took a lot of time. Even today it takes a lot of time to constantly any new product that we launch, we launch with one partner, but we constantly keep adding redundancies so that one system is down, we don't get impacted by it. And I think that that has been one of the hardest parts of keeping that repetition alive that uh, because when people look at Razorpay, they expect a certain level of service and, and we can't go back to them and say, hey, we are down because the bank is down and, and do what you may, right? And that's what the response a lot of gateways would give at that point of time. It was a lot of time to get there. It doesn't mean we've still 100% solved it. There's so many interconnected dependencies. For example, if something is uh, is wrong across two banks or three banks, then it's impossible to solve, right? 
right? And we still have a lot of those backend dependencies that cannot be completely solved. But over time, we have added enough redundancies that we are certain that 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 we can give the best possible service in the market that we operate in. But I think there's still room to do a lot more. So uh, I just have to say that I gave Harshal a bunch of questions, uh, and I'm asking very different questions here. So this is sort of like. This is life as an entrepreneur, right? You prepare everything in the morning and something. This is, this, is, this, is, this is how you converse with an investor. So, <laughs> so uh, I do want to say that we will have time at the end, maybe about five, six minutes for some questions from the audience. So if any of you do have questions, keep them, make a note of them and I'll just definitely make sure we come back to you. So we'll talk a little bit about company building and uh, team building, Harshal, uh, right? So again, you know, you and Shashank start out, it's a very small, you know, uh, skeletal team in the beginning. Today you told me you are 3,000 employees across five different locations on your 8th you know, annual day, uh, including the team in Malaysia. Right? Uh, so can you break this down perhaps to I don't know, two or three phases of uh, evolution of the company and what some of the surprises and challenges were in each of those phases and I presume there are some relatively younger companies here as well so that would be helpful for the audience. Yeah, so team building is one of the hardest parts of building a company and it gets harder and harder as the company becomes larger because you took like, uh, so when I mean, the company is 50 people strong, you've never run a business. So you're learning that, then you've learned that and now you're running a 500 people company and you've never learned, built a, run a 500, million, 500 people company. So then you're learning that and then suddenly you're running a 3,000 people company and you're learning that. So so it, 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 it is the biggest challenge that entrepreneur faces as a scale that, hey, are you well suited to run a company of this size? And and most entrepreneurs don't really have the experience, like very, very many entrepreneurs come with that experience of running like 2,000, 3,000 member teams, right? What what worked for us is that like, we had a very constant, deliberate focus on the org culture. And this is something that like, it gets lost somewhere in the rush of growth, and rush of revenues that org culture is one of the core tenants of company building and it has to be deliberate and the way it, you deliberate about it is that the way our culture is implemented changes at every stage of the company so to give an example right when when you are a 50 member team there's no there's no really clearly defined our culture our culture is what the founders say and do and the way founders decide things so people look at okay this is how you decide things okay do you value customer relationships more do you value sales more do you value growth more what do you value more in your decisions people look and learn and follow that when you reach 100 people, suddenly that doesn't work because not everyone interacts with the founders. So then, then you need to start coming up, and that's where when we created a came up with the culture values per se, which are some like four or five values that people fall back to. That people, these are the guiding principles when you're faced with a decision. And when you hit 500 or 1,000 people, then even those values are not enough because let's say you have a value of customer first, people don't understand what does that mean. Does that mean giving giving everything away for free because your customer is asking, or does it mean something else? So, so then you have to start defining those values in more clearer terms that, okay, this is the value, this is what it means. When you hit the R scale, like at 3,000 people, even that is not enough. You have to give people specific examples and that's the size when companies have culture handbook where you have to give specific examples of, okay, if you're faced with a decision where you can do this versus that, then you choose this. And uh, so, so let's say when saying, uh, is customers after everything more free or is customers after for additional feature, what do you choose? So, the way culture gets implemented changes at every stage of the journey. But I want to well, like a lot of founders come back to me and say, hey, we are now 500 people and our culture is bad. How do I change it? And some of them try to create a culture handbook then and say, hey, I'll just make a, I'll make a new culture handbook and the culture will change. That doesn't work. So this handbook or culture values and everything, these are the last fallback options. When people don't know what to do and they're confused, they fall back to this. But the culture is defined more by what you've started by doing, what decisions you've taken. Even today, right, like when Somebody comes up in the leadership commission and says, hey, we have, a, yeah, let's say we have wrongly charged a customer. Should we refund that money back uh, and suffer a revenue loss? Or should we take that revenue rate and like say, hey, you missed it and your problem. So the way you take each of these decisions, that's how the culture gets defined. And, and the culture is always shaping up. So we have, what I mean by deliberate is that when you take a pause and say, hey, I've, def I've set my culture and now it's flowing, Culture will keep evolving. As more people come in, everybody comes in with their culture, with their background, and it keeps evolving in a certain direction. So unless you're deliberate by it, about it, it is going in a direction that you don't control. I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, another way to say what you were saying was also that probably the value system will never change, but 
the process or uh, institutionalization of it over time, right? Because as people don't interact with you, otherwise every decision comes to you and you know instinctively what's to be done, right? Seen work well. Um, in fact, one of my co-founders was the founder of this company called Snapfish in, in the late 90s, which was a photo printing service. Right? in the US and what they did was they said look our customer is a midwestern mom of three children her name is Emily and they had put photos of various Emilys around the office right and what they wanted to do was push decision making down to the team and anytime you have to make an A versus B decision you look at and say what would Emily have wanted was, was their uh, mantra right or the other big example of Amazon having a chair always in the boardroom or in the meeting room for the customer and whenever there's any question, say, okay, what would this customer have wanted, right? So I think these are some things that when you're young as a company, you know, it's instinctive for you when you're also learning. But as the org changes, the scales, you've got to institutionalize some of these. No, it's, it's awesome. And, and uh, as a person as well, right? For you, uh, you know, obviously when you start off, you know, it's sort of like uh, young entrepreneurs, and there's nothing else you do, you know, sleep in the office, do all the, the funky stuff. But as time goes by, there is an org to manage, there are people who are perhaps much older than you in your organization, much more senior than you from an experience perspective. Uh, and frankly, probably we haven't even seen a lot more in certain areas. And uh, it's always very, uh, I used to find it very intriguing when, we were, when I was the, a lot younger. Today I'm probably the oldest guy wherever I go. But hiring people who are younger than you, or who are older than you, uh, but really according to you. So how, and, and obviously in a society like India, that's even more tricky. So how, what are some of these, some anecdotes of experiences that, you know, had you scratching your head and saying, okay, how do I deal with the situation? One or two would be helpful. Yeah, so I think going back to uh, the all building part, right? See, just some of the hardest problems that you have to learn as you go. And no, found, there's no coaching for this, there's no academy for this. You can't like attend a course and learn how to manage senior folks in the company. I think the way it works as, as a company scales is that I think you have some basic principles which we call culture or principles of company that you stay true to. But that doesn't mean that you make it like you don't want people to do exactly the way the way things that the way you do. There's a lot of value to the experience that you want to bring in. You just want to don't want to change some core tenets of the organization. So when we talk about culture, right, it doesn't mean that the org culture means I don't think the razor pay culture is same that it was at hundred people and the same at five hundred people or the same at thousand you know, people. Culture does change and it is expected to change. The, what worked for us to get to it's a $10 million of revenue wouldn't work to get us to $100 million of revenue. It would work to get us to a billion dollars of revenue. So some of these things need to evolve and a lot of that comes from the experience that people bring in. What you need to what you have to do is set up the right frameworks so that as people come in, they have those right frameworks to fall back on in, on what is acceptable as a change and what is not acceptable as a change. And like so um, so in the early days of the company we had one senior leader um, Side and he came in with a lot of experience and fixed a lot of things for us that were going wrong. Like improved productivity, improved efficiency, a lot of things for us. So, in, from an OKR perspective, we were setting all the OKRs out of the park, solving a lot of problems that we didn't have to keep dealing with anymore. But what we started slowly seeing, and that's where the, one of the core important aspects of keeping the culture right is having the right feedback loops. So, you have some of these early people in the company always that start murmuring whenever things start going wrong. And they'll come and trip to you on the first. That, hey, things are going wrong. This is not the way we used to do things. This is not. Now, you have to differentiate that. Is it is this wrong because it's against the culture? Is this wrong because we are learning a new way of doing things? And it's sometimes the hard line to figure out. Like sometimes, sometimes that change is required. You need to do things in a different way. But if it goes against the core culture values that is sought, the core principles of the company, then you have to take a hard call on that. So I am like six, eight months into the transition, we. Heard, we had heard enough and we had a, like we spoke to a lot of engineers and figured out that we, while the efficiency and everything was increasing, the core tenets of Razorpay were changing significantly, right, because of that. And we could take a call and say, hey, the efficiency of the company, is more, when a lot of companies take that call, that the efficiency of the team is more important to me than the core tenant that it set, or that core tenant is more important. And we took a call that the core tenant is important because we were a tech first company. For us, the long term, it was important for our engineers to feel that freedom to innovate because unlike a lot of businesses for us the differentiation for Razorpay comes when our engineers are able to figure out okay how to like how can I change this small process and improve latency how can I change this small process and improve the, the time to close and if the engineers don't have the freedom to do that then we'll be like any other incumbent that okay we are executing we are doing UPI payments we are doing card payments there's not a lot of delta in that so 
we decided long term it's important for us for our engineers to feel that freedom and we took a call to terminate that scene person it was surprise because people while they were murmuring nobody was really expecting that person to go away uh, and that built a lot of confidence in people that hey this this aspect of the company is so important that people started discussing about it even more uh, right so that feedback was portrayed now people are, are even more early in bringing that now as i said like this this is a there is a very thin line in that 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 what is what is the core tenet of coming that shouldn't change versus the ways of working that you should keep changing and learning from and that is the hard boundary to figure out but what i've seen in experience leaders and hiring experience leaders if i go back to it now looking at whatever i've seen in hiring leaders the best experience folks that we've hired are people who are in large companies but are unhappy in those large companies so the best people that we've seen are people folks we have hired are people coming from mastercard or people going from mx and so on and so forth but are really unhappy and feel kind of suffocated in these large jobs that hey i want to do so many things i want to take up more but this all doesn't allow me to move around and those are the hope have been the best absolute best hire because those people are unhappy and those people really want to work and they don't really care about working for a young founder or an old founder and so on and so forth uh, they don't care about traveling in economy class or business class these are guys who want to really move around and the large jobs don't allow them to move around so some of the most successful people in large jobs who have seen amazing growth paths have been very big failures in the startup journey because they are used to working that structured approach which most startups don't have at any scale uh, versus people who are really suffocated in those large jobs they have done great things but they're still very suffocated those have worked out really well for us that is an amazing insight right then you reflect all entrepreneurs just reflect on that because at some point you will bring in people from uh, larger organizations and make sure that they're leaving for the right reasons to come to you right i mean you're not chasing them because they've just been going through the ranks uh, because the culture may not, may be better suited for a larger company right? um let's switch a little bit for some uh, fun questions i'm going to ask you some tough questions now should i All right, favorite UPI app. Put <laughs> it straight on the spot. It was phone pay for a long time, but now credit. Now credit is it? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Why? Uh, I think the experience I've built now is far more rewarding. I think. I, I, like I don't like too much clutter in the app that I go into, and credit is a very different design. But the UPI thing is right out there. You open credit app, you can go to UPI, phone pay, try to push too many things. So that's my choice. Interesting. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's uh, put you on the spot. Type questions. Favorite book or most inspiring book? Uh, I don't know if it's a. It, it is structured as a book, but it's really a combination of stories. Founder set work by Jessica Livingston. It is a combination of stories of uh, some of the veteran founders. Like I think Steve Wozniak was the best story in that. But there are so many other stories. Uh, it was one of the first books I read when I started learning Razor Pay. It still stays true for me. Uh, favorite movie that helped you professionally? Helped you professionally? It's hard to say. Not be easy. The books help a lot more professionally. Movies are too short to really help. But I think I'll say, in some ways, Chuck Day was that movie. Awesome. For me, it's actually uh, Moneyball. I think I I watched that movie probably twice a year. There's, there's so much to learn from. just being slightly better than everybody else in, but in every aspect rather than trying to be you know, yeah, very we all love underdog movies <laughs> underdog movies are always fun um what do you do outside to unwind for long days or you know take time off have you taken any time off in these past eight years <laughs> no i think now uh, i made it up over oh, time oh, early days of course it's hard like i don't think you can Take a lot of time off. Now I have to at least keep my Sunday off. So Monday to Friday is working. Saturday is generally spillovers and things I like to do in my free time, like meeting founders and stuff. And Sunday I keep for myself. Okay. Um, right now I do a lot of stuff. I mean, uh, going around, I have a large group of friends. Uh, I I uh, like to go racing in the motor motor tracks. So that is generally always fun. Oh, pretty cool. I wouldn't have thought that. Um, One one last question coming back to Razor Pay itself, and then we'll talk a little bit about financial inclusion side of things. Um, when did you feel that oh boy, this thing is riding a, like riding a tiger now? This is getting to be a much much bigger than we ever anticipated. Um, and what was that feeling like? And you know, was it fear, excitement? You know, uh, I think when we turned it on, uh, 
and mostly because of external push. See, when you're in day to day, and I, I would not say it was more like, it was less that, hey, we are big and we have achieved something. It was more like, how far into the journey was that? It became really going to 2019, 2020, 2020. Six years. Yeah, six years. Ago. So uh, it was less that, hey, we have achieved something. It was more like, hey, now it's too big, right? Like, are we? It was more fear that, is this too big now? Like, can we continue to sustain it from here? Uh, I think it was that. But in the daily rut of things, it's yeah, like there's so much fight even today that you don't really have time to say, hey, we have achieved so much. It's mostly that, hey, we have so much more to do and uh, there's so much fear that can we continue to sustain it from here, even today. Got it. No, and, and that's a very different situation right? because you've transitioned from the underdog to to being you know, clearly the at least one of the leaders. And see, I think of the, the and it's kind of uh, contradictory, but the fears go up as you become larger. Like when you're early days, you don't have anything to lose. Yeah. Like you, you do everything, and you'll say, hey, we either 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 we'll make it or we'll not make it. It's not like anyone will care. But when you're larger, you constantly feel that hey, we, we we should go up and we should not fall flat from here. So the fears go up as you larger, and that's the and that's what worries me the most. That hey, like there is definitely a startup out there that's disrupting us, which is much less fearful than we are. So they'll be open to try a lot more things than we'll be able to try. That's true. Uh, but uh, do you also think that as you started uh, reaching this that phase, that more people wanted to come and help people? Uh, I mean, in the beginning, you have a lot of naysayers. Oh, it's never going to happen. You guys are never going to be able to pull it off. Maybe I was also in that category. But as things go by, right, uh, people start realizing that this is going to happen with or without us. And sometimes I feel companies hit that inflection point where all of a sudden it actually becomes a lot easier to do a few things. It's a mix of both. So, of course, growth trumps everything. So, there are investors, media, people you want to join, people who you want to hire, will say no, and then you grow and then they'll be open, right? But there are also people on the other side that as you grow more and more, they feel that, hey, you have grown too much, I don't think you can go from here. And we would have asked, we would be asked that question, if you were a hundred million company that, hey, grown too much, I don't think this space for a lot of more growth. At a unicorn level, at a 7.5 million level, that hey, you have grown a lot, I don't think this is room to grow up. So, people on both sides of the world, generally the answer to any naysayer is growth. So, as you keep going, the the, the older naysayers can change back and start believing you. Of course, you have newer, newer naysayers coming in and saying that you have grown enough. So, one thing though that you know I have observed now a little bit uh, closer, but in general, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk today about you know running companies with good unit economics, with you know, sensible like, uh, uh, business models and stuff like that. But you guys kind of silently focused on that right from the beginning, right? And I think most of your investors that I've had the privilege to interact with, they've always said this is probably one of the best run companies in India. So when did that, uh, what, what do you attribute that sort of mindset to, right? I mean, did it come very early? Is it like... And there's so many interesting questions and, and some of those investors in the early days would ask us, hey, why do you burn so less? And I remember like in the early days and you probably know that investor would come in and say, you're the least burning company in our portfolio. And he didn't mean it in a positive way. Right? Like, so he's like, why are you not burning? Why are you not growing faster? So I think a lot of it, like see, um, no offense to investors, but investors have different moods. A different point of time is a founder you have to cost it. Take I, I'm an entrepreneur by the way. My startup is a VC fund, but I'm yeah. not. So at all stages of company, you have to take all inputs and then take decide what is the right outcome. It doesn't mean that investor input is not valuable, but you have to take, decide what is the right way for building. For us, in from the early days, we knew that we are building a B2B company. And in a B2B company, that unit economics is important right from day one. Like it's it's not a consumer company, I can say, hey, I'll get 200 million. Uh, users and then I'll monetize them five years downstream, right? A B2B company has to make even on unit economics level right on day one. And the reason for that is like not less in terms of uh, profitability, but more in terms of that if a business is not paying you, it doesn't value. And the other way around is that any in a B2B space, if you are generating value for your customer, the business will be willing to pay you. So unlike consumers, which are sometimes irrational, they don't understand like, why should I pay you for this, right? Uh, Business generally are far more rational business decision makers. So they understand the value you bring in and they'll be willing to pay you. And if they are not willing to pay you, you probably are not bringing enough value in. So from that, the unit economics needs to make sense just for us to know that we are adding enough value to the business that we serve. Otherwise, we are not. It's interesting you say that, right? And as a, you know, I was a founding CEO of MCheck way before Paytm doing the mobile payments. And we asked people in the slum, this is I'm talking 2006 to 2010, uh, you know, Pradeep knows me from those days. 
and uh, we asked uh, people in all over india how much would you pay to pay your electricity bill through your phone most people like us would say zero because we had seven different options including sending the driver to stand in line and pay the bill but most people who worked in like a construction job or a maid servant or someone would pay anything from 3 to 20 rupees right and it, it got me to realize that time is money for that segment and they were doing the trade off of saying i have to take half day off from work and spend 20 rupees by bus and stand in the heat for 2 hours i'll pay 20 rupees to pay my electricity bill right because you know we all talk about time is money actually that is the segment where time is really money and uh, it i got to realize there that people pay for value in india right and and if we say that indians are cost conscious they are actually very value conscious right we pay disproportionate amount sometimes if the value is uh, clear uh, so it's probably a good way to segue into some of the financial inclusion side of things that we are talking about or we we were was original topic what are your views on what have we achieved over the last decade and you know how are we set up for the next decade to to bring in whether it's the msme sector whether it's the uh bottom of the pyramid whether it's the uh lower middle class segment i think the upper middle class segment is certainly in the system now right but uh, would would be great to hear your thoughts yeah so i think um uh, the whatever a lot of growth for companies like ours has happened because of the digital public infrastructure that india has built and and i think uh the kind of growth that the ecosystem has saw in last 9 years i think we would have taken at least 50 years to achieve that growth if there was no digital public infrastructure and this public infrastructure includes the likes of aadhaar to upi to uh, to the mpfc a that we are building now the ondc framework and so on and so on and so forth right like a lot of these things are yet to take off but the entire ecosystem around ekyc and everything has really shaped us up massively uh, because of uh, because of the the amount of access that it is increased right so when we launched phase up a we were just accepting cards right and and by that we could have reached probably maybe 100 million customers at max today we touch at least 300 to 400 million customers uh, in a year and that is possible because of upi aadhaar and the ekyc stack that exists today so i think the leap frog that we have seen is least on the consumer penetration side has been massive because of dpi uh, to but from a future perspective i think a lot of that penetration is for now is mostly limited to consumer side of things on the b2b side on an msme side i think you still yet to see or extract a lot of value out of that so yeah business have gained because they can serve customers across the country through through upi and other but the access to credit access to b2b transactions access to commerce through ondc which is happening now i think that's still limited so from a if you talk to an msme or a business owner pers- side their life has changed marginally so far and i think I think in the next ten years, that is going to be the massive change. Uh, the 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 business ecosystem and the B two B ecosystem is going to massively change, right? From access to credit, access to insurance, access to payments, access to uh, access to the market itself is going to massively change in the next ten years. And I think a lot of those building blocks are already there, but we are yet to see the penetration. The way consumer penetration happened in the last nine years, we'll see business penetration of those things happen in the next nine years. Awesome. No, I, I mean there there are some side benefits also of EKYC. So during my time at the UIDI, uh, I did the study on uh, telecom KYC. Right. So at the time, India was officially growing at two million KYCs. I mean, telco connections a month, but the reality was so much churn that we were actually adding close to fifty million connections a month, and there was a very high churn, and that meant that we were doing about one and a half million new connections a day. and if you do the arithmetic that is like 12 per second as right? so you just imagine when i snap my fingers 12 people got a sim card somewhere in india now it was a paper based process five sheets of paper minimum per kyc with the, all that stuff right if you do the math it works out to a tree gives you 80000 sheets of paper right we were cutting a thousand trees a day put it more uh, simply a million trees in 3 years Right now, try growing a million full-grown trees. Right now, you you look at AQI and you wonder why we have these issues here. Right, so um, just this whole move, you know, and obviously Geo did this first uh, at scale, where they did you know complete uh, like no pay, complete paperless onboarding with e-signatures and stuff. That just has saved us millions and millions of trees over the years. Right, so one aspect of it is sort of inclusion, instant availability, with better authentication and stuff. Uh, but the other aspect of it is actually this is also how we're going to you know uh, save ourselves right saving the environment is whatever we call it but one of the things that um, 
you know i wanted to also just impress on the founders here is we have an extraordinary digital public infrastructure here in india right it is you guys are starting out now i was doing m check in 2006 it would take 3 weeks to open a bank account and at that time the customers who got sim cards would have churned out of the system completely so even so the mobile number was no longer valid today people don't really change mobile numbers that frequently etc so it is an outstanding platform that we have as a starting point here and if you try to expand your business internationally and maybe you can talk 30 seconds about your experiences nobody has got this kind of infrastructure right so it feels like you're going backwards in time uh, how has the international business growth been for razor pay i know it's a big focus area uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about an indian company going overseas yeah. I think the great part of Indian ecosystem is that there's a lot of competition which pushes you to build some really superior tech. And the advantage of that is that when you go internationally that that superior product tech that we are building in India is actually superior not just in India but for a lot of other markets. So we launched in Malaysia about like early this year uh, after the getting a license and everything and the um, the space at which we've seen like so we do we do about 500 to 600 million dollars uh, gmv in malaysia far small compared to india maybe 100th of the size or 1/200th of the size but but in less than 6 months to scale there it get to us about 2 to 2 two, two and a half years to scale that much in india and we were able to scale that much in 6 months you know much smaller market uh, out there and the only reason is that there's not a lot of local players who have that much of product depth that we've been able to build in india and the great uh, thing that's happening across the world is that most of these countries are copying india and building their own versions of digital public infrastructure so malaysia launched do it now thailand launched prompt pay and every market is launching their own versions of upi and the advantage of companies who have built it, have already built and seen that scale is that like you can just replicate that product in that market and ride that wave of real time payments that we have all ridden in india fabulous last question and then we'll take a couple from the audience gen ai and oshin was is going to be a uh, poor guy staying up uh, to speak next uh how have you guys seen some early leverage in in the razor pay business and what do you see as the opportunities as so an ai of course is a fundamental building block like uh, like we spoke about earlier right and so many things can change one example is that like because we have used we are using it across risk and kyc and stuff but i'll give an example of kyc right so whenever we on board a merchant one of the documents that we collect is shop establishment act registration the challenge in india is that every single town or municipality has their own version and format of it Now, there's no way to standardize it so ocr doesn't work because the format keeps changing how many ocr models will you build and when so it took us it it, it used to take over 30 minutes to complete kyc largest problem being this and we have now implemented gen ai to read the document and make it filterable and we have gone down from 30 minutes to 5 minutes and i think there is a lot more room available to reduce it from there and that's just one example of where we implemented now we have implemented customer support we have implemented it in uh, in fraud and risk monitoring anomaly detection so we'll see a lot more use cases come up and I'll not take too much of time on that. I think we have a next speaker yeah. who is better suited to talk about it. But uh, there is a lot of use cases around it. Two quick questions from the audience. Yes, please. As yeah, so a local and recurring would take less than a day. Uh, uh, it actually used to take less than 30 minutes but regulations have changed so now it will take less than a day international uh, used to take one day uh, the same day but now there's a new regulation on pscb that has come in in last two months uh, from rbi which requires a full kyc so that means it will take almost a week uh, for you to go live on international now sure sure and said a lot of these things are regulatory dependent <laughs> If you're seeing good traction in your early days, just come to Prime Ventures for funding. Also, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> We also will do a turn on time and the share at the same time. Uh, any other questions, please? Yeah, go ahead. J- just shout it out. I'll I'll repeat it. He'll have to tell you, but he'll have to kill you after he says that. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, so, so broadly, as I said, the vision is to build, bring, build this one single financial ecosystem for businesses. So the idea is that if you start a business today, what all financial services you need as you expand and grow, and we'll build on that. So we have, we today have payments and uh, online payments, offline payments. We have, uh, we, uh, we have current accounts. We have uh, credit. 
We now have payroll. We recently launched vendor payments, so you can pay your vendors. You launched forex services, so if you raise money from foreign jurisdictions, we can power that. You of course have cross border. I think so. We'll keep adding on that. One of the recent things that we launched is on the loyalty side. That if you're a business and you want to scale and you want to build a loyalty platform, we we can implement that as well. So anything that a business needs from financial perspective, um, as it scales and grows, we'll keep keep adding those products and services. So some long term examples will be things like expense management, things like uh, disposal management, treasury management. Those are some things that we don't have, but should be in our roadmap long term. Terrific. Maybe one last question. Yes, please. Go ahead. Where, where people uh, talk to customers regularly in order to create the next set of products or features. Yeah, so that's an important thing to drive and we drive it top down. So we actually have a leaderboard for our CXOs that how many customers you spoke to in last two months and there's a constant battle that did I win it or did I, did I lose it between all our CXOs including the founders. Uh, and because of and that leaderboard is visible to the company. So we can see how, how, many, uh, how many customers are each of your leaders meeting every month, every quarter. And uh, and we actually do that. Who won this quarter? So, so that is one example, right? In the early days, what we used to do, it's hard to scale after we cost 500,000 employees. In early days, we used to do is that everyone had to do customer support at least one day of the month. So we had like fixed six, seven hours dedicated to chat support, and uh, and so even if you are an engineer, you would get on customer support calls or customer support chat and talk to customers. So a lot of innovation for us in the early days happened because the engineer would talk to the customer, realize, oh, he's He's using product this way and facing an issue, I can add this feature and make it better for him. So that that we continued at least till 500, 600 employees. It's hard to scale beyond that. So now we have customer empathy calls and so many other ways where an engineer or a product person can get to talk to our, uh, got, get to hear what our customers are facing or challenges our customers are facing. Okay, well, last question from me. How much cash do you have on you right now? On me? I don't remember, maybe, maybe 500 rupees. Okay, I, I have zero and I've had zero on me for the last six years actually. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. The only time I need cash is when I go abroad, right? Yesterday at the passport office for Tatkal, they made me withdraw 2000 rupees for my mom's renewal. But really, I've never touched cash and really all of that is kudos, a lot of that is kudos to the work you guys have done, Harshal. Thanks so much for being here. Congratulations and all the best. Thank you. Thanks, Anjay. Let's have a big hand for Harshal, guys.